on World News Tonight. COVID scare. Top officials in the U.S. test positive for COVID. Find out tonight what the White House has to say about the COVID risk to the president. Continuing violence. Russia steps up attacks in eastern Ukraine. Western nations vow more arms for Ukraine despite Russia's warning of nuclear war. Suchi jailed. A court in Myanmar sentenced the deposed leader to prison. Tonight, more details on what's in store for Aung San Suu Kyi. And pampering poachers. It's happy bark day for the doggos in Dubai as they get served with cupcakes. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, Russia's Vladimir Putin told the visiting UN chief Antonio Guterres that he still had hope for negotiations to end the conflict in Ukraine. Early after talks with Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in Moscow, Guterres had called for independent probes into possible war crimes in Ukraine. Today, Russia's Gazprom told Poland and Bulgaria it would halt gas supplies. Ukraine is preparing to face off against a full-scale Russian assault in the east, and Western powers want to make sure Kyiv's forces are ready. During defense talks at the U.S.'s Ramstein Air Base in Germany, where representatives from more than 40 countries were in attendance, the U.S.'s Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin announced that support for Ukraine would be reviewed on a monthly basis. Today's gathering will become a monthly contact group on Ukraine's self-defense. And the contact group will be a vehicle for nations of goodwill to intensify our efforts and coordinate our assistance and focus on winning today's fight and the struggles to come. Since the start of Russia's invasion, weapons from the West have been pouring into Ukraine to bolster its position. Most of the supplies have come from the U.S. Washington has donated 5 billion euros worth of arms. France has given 100 million euros. The U.K. has sent more than 200 million, while Germany, for its part, has given nearly 120 million euros. Berlin has now ramped up its supports following pressure from its allies. It announced Tuesday that it would send Gepard anti-aircraft tanks, marking a major shift in policy away from providing mainly defensive arms to sending heavy weaponry. It is right that Germany delivers heavy weapons to Ukraine, as announced today. There was a change of the stance throughout the past week to deliver heavy weapons to Ukraine with Germany's support. The flow of arms into Ukraine has enraged Moscow. The Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov warned of World War III if the West continued to supply Ukrainian forces. On Monday, Russia launched airstrikes at five railway stations in central and western Ukraine. The sites play a critical role in funneling foreign weapons into the country. A court in military ruled Myanmar sentenced deposed leader Aung San Suu Kyi to five years in jail today after finding her guilty in the first of the 11 corruption cases against her. A Myanmar court sentenced Aung San Suu Kyi to five years in jail for corruption on Wednesday. Her trial is being held behind closed doors, but according to a source with knowledge of proceedings, the judge handed down the verdict within moments of the court convening. Suu Kyi has been charged with at least 18 offences, which carry combined maximum jail terms of nearly 190 years if convicted in all. This latest case centred on the allegation that Suu Kyi accepted gold and cash payments from her protégé turned accuser, former chief minister of the city of Yangon, Pyo Min Thane. The Nobel laureate has been held in an undisclosed location since early 2021, when she was forced from power by the military in a coup. It's not clear if Suu Kyi will now be transferred to a prison to serve her sentence. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un vowed to strengthen the country's nuclear weapons program during the speech at the high-profile military parade in Pyongyang. A plan to bolster his country's nuclear arms. On Monday, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un announced his intentions to strengthen the country's nuclear arsenal. The fundamental mission of our nuclear forces is to deter a war but our nukes can never be confined to the single mission of war deterrent. 
The nuclear forces, the symbol of our national strength and the core of our military power, should be strengthened in terms of both quality and scale. The speech took place at a military parade in Pyongyang, celebrating the 90th anniversary of North Korea's armed forces. On display as part of the celebrations, North Korea's largest known intercontinental ballistic missile, the Hwasong-17. Over the border in South Korea, experts were quick to explain the significance of the speech. Though he did not specify, he indicated more broadly that the nuclear force might be used preemptively, not only when they're under attack, but also under certain circumstances. Pyongyang has recently stepped up weapons tests and displays of military power as denuclearization talks with the United States have stalled. US and South Korean officials say that there are signs of new construction at North Korea's only known nuclear test site, officially closed in 2018. North Korea is banned by the United Nations from developing ballistic missile and nuclear weapons and is under economic sanctions as a result. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said today that he will address in the coming weeks a long-awaited national security strategy to deal with the emergence of China as a great power. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says he will soon lay out the Biden White House strategy for dealing with China's emergence as a great power. After more than a year since Biden took office, the administration has taken flack from Republicans for lacking a formal approach to Washington's main strategic competitor. Blinken spoke to a Tuesday hearing at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I will have an opportunity, I think, very soon in the coming weeks uh, to speak uh, publicly uh, and in some detail about the, uh, about the strategy. Blinken faced grilling from Senator Mitt Romney on a military agreement signed between China and the Solomon Islands. Our uh, lead China expert at the White House, uh, Kurt Campbell, along with the Assistant Secretary uh, for the region, Dan Crittenbrink, led a delegation to the Solomon Islands. The delegation met with uh, the Prime Minister. He vowed publicly as well as privately that uh, there would be no Chinese military base, uh, no long-term presence, uh, no power projection capability. We will be watching that very, very closely in the weeks uh, and months ahead. A source familiar with the plans, however, said that the China plans Blinken covers publicly won't be very detailed. U.S. President Joe Biden will host ASEAN leaders at a summit in Washington on May the 12th and 13th. And he is expected to visit Asia, including South Korea and Japan, later this month. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight and we move on to the updates of the COVID crisis around the globe. Three quarters of Beijing's 22 million people began lining up for COVID-19 tests as authorities in the Chinese capital raced to stamp out an outbreak and advert the kind of citywide lockdown that has surrounded Shanghai for a month. Long snaking PCR queues are back in Beijing as parts of the city are transformed into mass testing sites. This in a bid to contain a fresh Omicron outbreak. Beijing's Chaoyang district currently accounts for the highest number of cases. It's a sentiment shared by many here. The rolling out of mass testing has sparked fears that a Shanghai-style lockdown may be on the horizon for Beijing. In China's biggest city, 25 million residents have been confined to their homes for weeks. The strict lockdown has meant people in Shanghai have had erratic access to food. Fearing they might face the same fate, residents in Beijing are stocking up. While the number of new infections remain relatively low in Beijing, authorities aren't taking any chances as they cling on to the government's zero-COVID strategy. All the new cases have been put under control. The capital is currently at a critical stage of epidemic prevention and control. Beijing reported 33 new infections on Tuesday, a small figure compared to Shanghai, where 16,000 new cases and 52 new deaths were recorded. U.S. Vice President is isolating at home after joining millions of Americans who tested positive for COVID-19. The White House says that she does not have symptoms and her list of recent close contacts does not imply to the President or the First Lady, whom she last spent time with over a week ago. 
U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris tested positive for COVID-19 on Tuesday, but is not showing any symptoms, according to a spokesperson who said that Harris has not been in close contact with President Joe Biden or First Lady Jill Biden and is in isolation. In recent weeks, Harris's husband, her communications director, and White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, among others, have disclosed positive tests. Officials have said Biden's regular contact with advisors and supporters could expose him to COVID, but the administration is keen to project a sense of normalcy. White House COVID-19 response chief Ashish Jha said on Tuesday that it's hard to ensure no one gets COVID, including President Biden. We have a very, very contagious variant out there. It is going to be hard to ensure that no one gets COVID in America. That's not even a, a policy goal. The goal of our policies should be obviously minimize infections whenever possible, um, but to make sure people don't get seriously ill. While infections have risen in the United States, fueled by the highly transmissible Omicron BA2 subvariant, hospitalizations remain low. Since the Omicron surge, a nationwide blood survey released Tuesday showed some 58 percent of Americans have been infected with the coronavirus since the start of the pandemic. The study, issued by the CDC, marks the first time more than half of the U.S. population has been infected with the virus at least once. But the CDC also cautioned that the antibodies do not necessarily protect against future infections. In Africa now, the spread of Ebola is raising concerns as the second person has died. This time the outbreak is because of a new spilling event, meaning that the disease was transmitted from an infected animal. A second Ebola patient has died in northwestern Democratic Republic of Congo, the World Health Organization said on Tuesday, just days into a fresh outbreak of the deadly disease. The 25-year-old woman was the sister-in-law of the first case, the WHO said on Twitter. The first patient began showing symptoms on April the 5th, but did not seek treatment for more than a week. He died in an Ebola treatment center on April 21st. The time lag has health workers rushing to identify contacts who may have been infected, the WHO said. The organization reported that at least 145 people had come into contact with the confirmed cases and their health is being closely monitored. Genetic testing has shown the infection confirmed last week in the city of Umbandaka was a new spillover event, according to the National Institute of Biomedical Research. That means a transmission from an infected animal and not linked to any previous outbreaks. Congo's equatorial forests are a natural reservoir for the Ebola virus, and the country has seen 13 previous outbreaks of Ebola, including one from 2018 to 2020 that killed nearly 2,300 people. Amazon's Jeff Bezos tweets after Elon Musk's $44 billion cash deal, asking if Elon Musk's tweet gives China leverage. The second richest person in the world used Twitter to shine a light on Elon Musk's $44 billion deal to buy the social media platform. Just hours after Twitter agreed to be bought by Musk, who supplanted Bezos as the world's richest person last year, the Amazon founder tweeted, quote, did the Chinese government just gain a bit of leverage over the town square? While he followed that up with probably not, the post brought fresh scrutiny to the deal in the very town square he referenced. Since the beginning of Musk's pursuit of Twitter, which he intends to take private and initiate changes at the company, some have asked what the deal will mean for Twitter's content policy in China, where the social media platform is blocked. Hello. Musk has key business interests in China as Tesla relies heavily on the country for production and vehicle sales. A Tesla spokesperson said the company has no comment and Twitter did not immediately reply for comment. But China's foreign ministry weighed in, saying on Tuesday that there was no basis for speculation that Beijing could try to use leverage over Tesla in order to influence content on Twitter. Some Twitter users have threatened to leave the microblogging site, fearing Musk, a self-described free speech absolutist, could bring about less content moderation and the reinstatement of banned individuals, though the most well-known of the banned Twitter users, former U.S. President Donald Trump, said he would not be rejoining the platform even if his account is reinstated.
Dramatic police body cam footage shows the moment officers arrive on the Rust film set. Also, a New Mexican County Sheriff released a body cam video of actor Alec Baldwin talking to police officers on the set of the film Rust. New body cam footage shows the chaotic moment when officers arrived on the Rust film set after a gun went off in actor Alec Baldwin's hand, killing the film cinematographer and injuring its director. 32 Santa Fe, one female shot in the chest, male shot in the stomach, requested an air flight. The Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office released the video on Monday, which showed medics and officers tending to cinematographer Helena Hutchins and film director Joel Souza. They are then brought out on stretchers and rushed into an ambulance. Mr. Baldwin. Baldwin, who's dressed as an Old West gunslinger, speaks with a police officer at the scene. Um, so uh, my understanding, um, you, were, you were in the room when the lady, when someone I was, was shot? holding the gun, yeah. Okay, all righty. Um, what do you 42-year-old Hutchins was killed during the filming in October when the revolver Baldwin was holding fired a live round that struck her in the chest and lodged in the shoulder of Sousa. Sousa survived the gunshot wound. Baldwin was later questioned by police. And what I'm curious about is what came out of that bullet that went through her body and into his shoulder? That's pretty powerful. He told them the gun that went off in his hand was given to him by armorer Hannah Gutierrez. She hands me the gun. I'm assuming she's done it the right way. She's done it the last two weeks. I put it in the holster. I pull it out slow. We're rehearsing. We're not filming anything. I pull it out slow, turn, cock the pistol, bang, it goes up and she hits the ground. Baldwin, who is also a producer on the film, has been named in several lawsuits filed in connection with Hutchins' death, including one by her husband. Baldwin denies responsibility for her death and says live rounds should never have been allowed onto the set of the Western film at Bonanza Creek Ranch in New Mexico. That's a bullet. So right. as I suspected, somebody put a live round in the gun. If that's a bullet that was pulled out of his shoulder, then someone loaded a live round into the gun I was holding. I'm Sergeant Zook. The body cam footage also showed an initial conversation with Gutierrez, the film's armorer. Police said a formal decision on criminal charges would depend on further forensic work. So you're in charge of the Baldwin said in his police statement that a very important question for Gutierrez is whether she ever commingled live rounds with theatrical rounds in her kit. We're going to escort you down to our sheriff's office. The state of New Mexico last week fined Rust Movie Productions the maximum amount possible, $137,000 for what it called willful safety lapses leading to the death of Hutchins. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Pakistani Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif visited the Chinese embassy in Islamabad to express his deepest condolences to the families of victims in a terrorist attack and vowed to bring the perpetrators to justice. Russian energy giant Gazprom halted gas supplies to Bulgaria and Poland for failing to pay for gas in rubles. The Kremlin's toughest response yet to the crippling sanctions imposed by the West over the conflict in Ukraine. The head of the World Health Organization urged countries to maintain surveillance of coronavirus infections, saying the world was blind to how the virus is spreading because of falling testing rates. Huawei has identified helping businesses to use 5G technology and improve their energy efficiency as among ways to bolster the company in a phase of mounting challenges, its rotating chairman said. Consumers in South Korea are showing levels of concern as public expectation over inflation rates has hit a nine-year high. Despite this, for a second month in a row, local consumers are apparently optimistic about the overall South Korean economy. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with visuals of happy dogs being served with pupcakes in a special cafe in Dubai. Thank you for watching us. Have a good night.